All right, I guess I'll, I'll kick it off. I want to thank everyone for coming on. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Sound check is great. Uh, Wally, it's great to have you here on the West Coast. Uh, Jonathan, thanks for uh, masterminding this with Art, putting it together. Uh, we don't have a set structure. We had a meeting this morning to go over some important stuff. And uh, first thing I want to do is give opportunity for everyone here to introduce themselves. You've got two to three minutes, Wally, John, and Art, to uh, introduce yourself to the attendees that are uh, coming on board. Uh, let me start with you, Wally. I want to congratulate you on starting the MOD Institute. Are you pronouncing it MOD or are you pronouncing it MOD? MOD, yep. MOD. Yep. Uh, congrats uh, on the success with that. So you're doing a three-day course right now, if I understand, on the West Coast. Uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, for those of you guys who don't know, um, I, I have a training center that is focused on 3D printing. And it is something that I'm super passionate about because... I do think that 3D printing is going to change dentistry um, in a very positive way for our patients. And I've seen the positive impact that giving patients options has through the power of printing in your office. Um, I have a private practice as well, where I practice three days a week. My practice is mostly cosmetic um, and larger comprehensive cases. I'm a fee for service practice. Um, I do a lot of no prep, minimum prep 3D printed veneers and quadrant type dentistry there, but I also do a lot of um, full mouth reconstructions and all on X prosthetics as well. Um, we have developed a curriculum that is designed to take somebody who is new to 3D printing and energize them by empowering them to print in their office, but not only just print, but also learn how to design as well so that you have the tools you need to do the full circle development for your patients. So you could do same day dentistry without having to necessarily have a mill if you want to choose to 3D print. Um, we also have really excited workflows, exciting workflows around um, dentures and removables. I know you, you, this is mostly an implant crowd here, but we still do a ton of dentures for people. And I love how 3D printing is changing, how we could offer that service to our patients through same day dentures. Um, and things like that could really cut um, cut time needed to manufacture things for people. And so um, that's me in a nutshell. I left academics, 15 year career in academics as a dean. Um, and at the dean level, I had a lot of fun and exciting times in academics, but I got frustrated with bureaucracy and I got frustrated with not being able to really impact the lives of the students who I was teaching in a, in a, in a way that I really wanted to. So I left academics to try to pursue a career in, in education. Great. Uh, I kind of felt silly asking you to introduce yourself. Uh, you didn't need an introduction, Wally. So thanks for doing that and bailing me out. So, Ari, if you can uh, uh, give a little bit of background of yourself and what exactly what you do, if you're a dentist, if you're a technician. I actually don't know if you're a dentist or not, Art. Yeah, so I'm a dentist. <laughs> I'm a general practitioner in uh, California. And I uh, have an implant-based practice, so we um, focus on implants, but, you know, we pretty much do everything here. Uh, full mouth reconstruction is kind of our focus. Uh, I have an in-house dental lab, and, uh, you know, for all those that you guys are thinking about doing a full house in the dental lab, um, I always say think twice. <laughs> I, don't, I don't regret it. I don't regret it, but uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears. And um, so about five years ago, um, Fernando Blanco came into my life. And uh, since then, we were just been tinkering. Uh, but even prior to that, I met um, Jonathan Abenham. And uh, I think that was probably about five and a half, six years ago, Jonathan. And uh, that's where my brain really started going when it came to just digital dentistry. And, uh, you know, Jonathan really inspired me to uh, really pursue uh, digital dentistry at a higher level. And then um, thereafter is when Fernando came on board. And it really started changing things. You know, Fernando is responsible for bringing a 3D facial scanning technology uh, to dentistry back in 2014, I think. And so since then, uh, it all started as tinkering, um, not necessarily something that we thought would grow into what we can now call Instaresa. Um, but what we found was that, you know, 3D facially generated treatment planning and execution um, is really instrumental when it comes to full mouth reconstruction. And it doesn't matter if you're doing dentures, veneers, crown and bridge, or all in X, um, having the face to start um, the case is very, very essential. And it really streamlines the process. 
And so that's my focus, you know, my focus is really trying to build in efficiencies into the workflow, um, really minimizing the chair time, outsourcing to the laboratory uh, because our chair time is precious. And so uh, just like you, Wally, we, we teach courses on, uh, you know, 3D facially generated dentures, um, full mouth reconstruction, whether it's crown or bridge or, or all on X. And so we found some ways to uh, really enhance um, the experience for the patient, the laboratory, and the dentists, uh, all the people involved in these types of cases. And uh, we've been able to leverage, uh, we're not a lab, uh, we've been able to leverage, you know, certifying labs throughout the country that, that understand the workflow and um, can serve uh, the doctors that, that we train. Um, a lot of this, the foundation of all this, I got to give uh, props to Dr. John Coyce, who's my uh, mentor. Um, everything it has to do with just, you know, treatment planning and um, execution was taught to me from uh, the Coyce Center with John Coyce. And uh, that's where I'm a clinical instructor. And what we've been able to do is just really take the fundamentals in the analog world and convert it into the digital world. Um, and so nonetheless, uh, we're here to share. Uh, I want to thank Jonathan for thinking of this idea to put it up together. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this. So with that being said, I'll hand the baton to uh, Jonathan. Thanks so much. Um, I'm sure you guys know who I am. My name is Jonathan Abenheim. Uh, I'm just a general dentist. I come up with some solutions for digital dentistry and I'm really honored to be here with these guys and to really share with you some, some stuff, answer your questions really. The goal of this the reason we put this together was you know, sometimes we were embarrassed to ask questions. There's a chat button on the side. If you guys have any questions about anything, uh, this is really like an open forum. Wally and Armin are, are moderating it and sharing their experiences. And um, although you guys, uh, Armin asked us to introduce ourselves, but I'll introduce Armin himself because he doesn't even introduce himself. You know, Armin is... Uh, you guys may or may not realize, but a lot of what we do today is based on his work, like super early on when I was a young Wait, dental this student. This is being recorded, right? <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. It's recorded. You don't even have to screenshot it this time. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Keep going. And, all right. And uh, a lot of what we do, you know, like back when I was a dental student, you know, I used to log into Dental Town and see a lot of what he was doing with really poor technology in comparison to what we have today. And although the, the dental uh, final product was always the same, it's what we always achieve, wanted to achieve, um, he was doing it with, you know, really subpar technology, subpar hardware, and he was really being very innovative. And it's sort of like easier for us now because we sort of have great computers, we have great video cards, we have great manufacturing tools. And back then it wasn't like that, you had to trick a little machine you know, like the little uh, Wally to go and just mill all day long and never break and figure out how to do something really, really well, really, really fast without going bankrupt. And uh, I have to thank, I have to thank him and we should all thank him that we're actually here because if he didn't have, you know, create that road for us, um, we wouldn't have that. And now, you know, as, as his company is doing it for us, like really being there and supporting us as uh, users and, and really, you know, making things affordable. And he's back at it with his own education that he, you know, level one. And if those of you that are on here, you're like, think some of the things that we talk about, you're like, whoa, I don't know even know what a 3D printer is. I don't even know what a, what a facial scanner is. I don't, hell, I don't even have an internal scanner. I just got digital x-rays and that's also okay. You know, Armin has an unbelievable level one course that will legit walk you through it. And you won't have to be afraid to ask any questions or not feel smart enough. And because at the end of the day, we all start somewhere and you got to start somewhere and uh, you're there. And, and, and watching this, really, the point is that, that the reason you have these four people here is because we come from all different, all different walks of how we do digital dentistry. At the end of the day, our final product should always be the same. It should be functional. It should be cosmetic or aesthetic. And it should be long lasting. Now, how we get there, we're very similar yet very different. But at the end of the day, we still are always, always, always teaching what we do every single day in our own business, in our own practice. And it's not that we do one case. 
you know, like my Powerball screw has almost 30 or 35,000 screws in under three years in people's mouths. I mean, that's not, I'm tired of reading comments about, is this public, is this peer reviewed? Man, I have all the data. It's there. It's happening. And, and these guys up here are doing it every single day. You know, Awali is pushing the limits with things that you never thought could be able to be done. You know, uh, art is finally making sure that you're smiling perfectly. That when you smile and you bite down, it's functional. It's based off of his Koi's concept and he uses digital dentistry. You know, Armin is making sure that when you buy your scanner, it doesn't go in the closet. You can actually use it and be functional and be there to do it. You got to understand, we're here to teach you this because we want you to be successful. That, that's really the goal. Every single person here is successful in their own clinical practice. They don't, it's very simple to do the old way where you never knew the guy's lab. You never knew what he did. You didn't know anything. Everything was a big secret. Nobody ever shared in the 70s and the 80s. You never knew. But today's world, we're sharing with you because we want you to be successful. People say, well, you've got a course to sell. Man, if we donate our time, you're going to pay for it. But at the end of the day, it's the knowledge that you're imparting from all the hours and days and months that we put into it for you to have the final answer at the end of the day that you know it's going to be predictable. And it's not because we did it once. It's because we did it over and over. And at, at the end of the day, I always say, what differentiates a great clinician from a, a, a normal clinician is knowing how to fix the problems when they happen. Because they always happen. They always, always happen. Your scanner may not turn on. Your scanner may not be uh, uh, correct. Your patient may move. We got to be able to teach you how to get around that. Complications is everything. Well said. Armin, I think you're uh, muted, yep. Mars. I mute myself. Uh, I've got a quick little video to show you. I think this will be a great topic, great conversation. We could probably spend the next hour on this one little 30 second, 20 second clip. I know, John, you mentioned that uh, we, we have users that are new to digital. They don't know what printing is. They don't know what scanning is. But the, I imagine the people you three are drawing right now are all full arch people. So I thought I'd start off with this video here which will parlay off of the conversation we had this morning and Art mentioned uh, the, using appropriate scan bodies. So uh, what I wanna show here is a video of two scan bodies on an edentulous At ridge. Nine. At nine? Eight. And can you guys see my screen? I'm tomorrow and my interview. I gotta go. Uh, I hear somebody talking in the background. If you can mute yourselves, that'd be great. I have somebody final is that John, is that you? Not me. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, you guys can see on the screen, we got a flat edentulous ridge in the lower jaw. We got two scan bodies. And as we're scanning this, uh, the software and the scanner project yet a third scan body into the equation. So uh, this is a good, good topic to discuss. So what's happening here? Why did that happen? Why do we have three uh, scan bodies showing up when there's only two physically present? Uh, what's happening to our scan strategy? What's happening to uh, the whole process of how images are captured when you're scanning a, a redundant dentulous symmetric ridge. Uh, let's start off with you, John. Uh, can you give us a one or two minute explanation of what's happening here? Yes. So this is exactly why whenever you post something or whenever I post something, they will say to you, an intraoral scanner is not accurate. And it's not accurate because the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry says it's not accurate. And it's inaccurate because the Journal of Oral Implantology will say it's inaccurate or whatever, ever, everything you would want to say will always tell you it's inaccurate. And that's why you need to buy photogrammetry. And the reason it's inaccurate is that because if you actually look at the way scan bodies are designed, they are actually designed for the tabletop. They are not designed for the mouth. What happens is that when you scan and you're so far away from so many things, your scanner will always get confused. And you may not see it. You may not actually be able to see such a massive discrepancy in this third phantom scan body, right? You may not see it. It may be deep into the STL. And the reason that for that is because you are trying to use something that's made for a desktop scanner to be able to work with an intro or scanner. And this is why was the number one reason that I figured out that this was the problem. And what I learned was that 
or what I teach is that we, nobody will ever say to you that you can't use an intraoral scanner for teeth. You just can't. We use it for teeth all the time. Nobody will ever say, no, you can't use it for teeth. You could use it for teeth. You just can't use it for implants. Well, why? Well, you know, because that's what the papers say. Well, tell me why it doesn't work. And anytime you challenge someone, they will say, well, it just doesn't work in my hands. No, it doesn't work in your hands. It doesn't work in someone else's hands. It doesn't work for a specific reason. And the reason is, is that when you try and scan implants with scan bodies that don't look like teeth, remember that, scan bodies that do not look like teeth your scanner will always be off. Now, there's other things that, that, that play in. The fact that it's a mandibular ridge, there's massive amount of light reflection, there's massive amount of movement of the tissue. All these things we get around, that, that, that's part of what we teach you. One of my inventions in my patents were we invented this scan body that looks like teeth, so that when you scan an implant, you're essentially scanning teeth. Uh, very good. Uh, Art, you want to add anything to that? You're muted, Art, and while you're also muted, you're coming up next. <clears throat> and I think uh, I agree with Jonathan. You know, a lot of the literature that's out there is based on scanning um, existing scan bodies and scanning a large edentulous ridge such as this. And when you don't have geometry uh, from one scan body to the next, specifically the soft tissue, Right. If, for example, if you were to get your your intraoral scanner and you scan a flat wall, your scanner doesn't know what it's scanning because it all looks the same. But if you start throwing, you know, spackle and create geometry on the wall, your intraoral scanner is going to work. So to just say that the intraoral scanner doesn't work, it has they're 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 eliminating the cause of it. And so, you know, for our, the way we do things is we created that geometry in between each scan body that allows the intraoral scanner to track. And then the scan body itself has to have unique features so that it doesn't all look the same. I mean, that was one of the things that I learned in Jonathan's course, you know, six years ago is if every scan body is cylindrical like this, then it all looks the same to the intraoral scanner. Right, there has to be some differences from one scan body to the next, whether it's the rotation of a flat edge, something unique. And so as a result, you know, we've been getting passive fitting restorations for almost five years now using an intraoral scanner. And so, you know, I shared this earlier with, with, uh, with the guys is that, I mean, I think we're approaching almost 5,000 arches um, of docs, not just me, that are using our intraoral scanning system with our scan bodies and scan dart to get passive fitting restorations. But the key is, is that, you know, there has to be a good scan path. There has to be geometry between the scan body, the scan, there's many, many factors. And so, but just to negate it and say it doesn't work, I think is a big, um, a big problem. Thanks, Art, for that. Uh, Wally, it's pretty clear we all agree that uh, these scan bodies that uh, traditional manufacturers put out are essentially the wrong armamentarium to use for full arch scanning of edentulous ridges. Yeah. Uh, it's just classic, right? We have a lot of engineers that build stuff for us, and as clinicians, we're like, this is useless. I can't use this in the patient's mouth. So to us, these traditional scan bodies are contraindicated for edentulous cases. They're great if it's tooth borne. Generally, you need it to be tall enough or almost an even plane with adjacent teeth. So it's great for tooth borne cases. It's tricky for distal extension cases. And it's definitely the wrong armamentarium uh, for uh, flat edentulous ridges that are very symmetric. And we see the same repetitive pattern over and over again. It's very easy for the scanner to take data from here and inadvertently place it over here just because things look too symmetric. So we got to mm -hmm. disrupt that symmetry. That's why the upper jaw is much easier to scan then the lower jaw, we've got the rugae, we've got all kinds of things to help us out. And the lower jaw, uh, the longer you go, the longer the spaces between each scan body also, that also can introduce errors as well. So what would you say is a remedy for this, Wally? We'll, turn, we'll go back to Art and Jonathan and ask them how they've uh, remedied and solved this problem. Uh, they've customized yeah. things. Uh, Art already mentioned it. He breaks this pattern <laughs> up with uh, having his uh, uh, material that breaks up that, uh, that repetitive pattern. Uh, what would you recommend while people do uh, if they want to use intraoral scanners, yet they're worried about introducing errors of this magnitude in the equation? 
Yeah, you know, that's a really good point. This is a the symptom of a disease that we have in dentistry where engineers are manufacturing parts for us that don't test parts in the mouth. They test it on stone models or they don't even use the intraoral scanner to test it. They're using lab scanners. These parallel cylinder scan bodies were developed for the lab industry for scanners that have a field of view that are four or five inches um, square. When we talk about intraoral scanners, we have to stitch hundreds, if not thousands of images together to compose a, a, a 3D model composing of over a million vertices and triangles. And to have scan bodies that are tall parallel cylinders with no distinct features on them is terrible. Um, one way that we could probably try to combat this, and I don't have any patents around this, the, the other two gentlemen that are with us have tons of patents in this space, but I would shorten the scan bodies, make them um, not so long and parallel. I would make distinct features on them so it's not just a smooth cylinder. And um, I would help try to develop some type of solution for long edentulous spaces between um, the scan bodies. So if you have an all on four case where you have huge distances between scan bodies, something that will help the camera track. And, and I think um, it's a shame that most studies that are published in the literature that say you can't use scanners for all on X prosthetics with passive fits, they look at these long parallel scan bodies that were designed for lab scanners. They don't look at new solutions that are on the market. A great square review there, Wally. That's uh, pretty much what's uh, launched uh, Jonathan on his stratospheric rise uh, with, uh, with the scan bodies that he came up with uh, to address this issue. Another a simple concept I always convey to people is uh, when you're using an intraoral scanner, the length of the scanner is much longer than the width of the scanner. So when you get to the anterior for imaging this way, you're only capturing so much data on the width of the camera. You're not getting as many data points, but if you just turn your camera 90 degrees this way, you have a good two, three millimeters longer field of view. And if you happen to pick up a slice of a superstructure on one side and another superstructure on this side in one of the green boxes, your confidence skyrockets it's accurate. But if you hit a patch of edentialism between two superstructures or two prep teeth, you must assume that patch of edentialism has introduced errors in the equation and your model's inaccurate. So John, I think in the parlay off of that and expand on how and why you came up with your idea of developing your own scan bodies. What is addressed? Did, you, did your scan bodies systematically address everything Wally just brought up? Uh, how would you categorize that? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> it's funny. It's, it's as if, you know, like you, you can hear when you hear another educator and another expert speak, and it's not about like, you know, knowing to invent it. It's identifying the problem. He's like, yeah, I know this is wrong. I know what I need, I, I would want, and I know exactly what I need. And then what a traditional dentist, which, and, it, and, I, I'm, and Wally is not a, alone in this. A lot of dentists are very, very smart. The problem is that when they come up with this solution in their brain, they open the dental catalog and it's just not there. So they say, okay, well, I just, it's not there, forget about it. And they move on with their day and then just deal with what's there. So when you think about it, um, everything that we do in digital dentistry today, uh, I would say a, a lot of it, not everything, I don't like to say everything, but a lot of it is based on what we did in the analog world. It's like, we're not so innovative, to be honest. Like, you know, we say, oh, I'm so smart, I invented this. Well, you're not really that smart. Because when you think about it, if you've been doing implants long enough, you know that there's something called an open tray and a closed tray impression tray right? And uh, prosthodontists in the room would stand up and say, oh, I just do open tray. And uh, the general dentist says, well, I just do closed tray because that's easier. And uh, the literature shows that unless you have a massive buccolingual, buccolingual angulation at the end of the day, it's exactly the same. But let's say for a second that open tray is actually more, um, more accurate. You learn that if you're actually doing open tray impression, and you have multiple units together, what do we learn? We splint them together. We splint them together because when we take an impression, we don't want it to move. So why do you think that if you have a, a, a scan body, even a well-designed scan body, like my JA scan body or my THS cap, right? A well-designed scan body that you think that all of a sudden you can get rid of that analog concept that says that you need to splint things together for it to be accurate. 
Well, just because you scan it correctly with the right scan body, you have a massive space. And for me, the, the classification is that if your scanner will not pick up two superstructures like Armin said, that means a scan body and a scan body in one box, right? That's one box that you have a scan body and a scan body. You now have an inaccurate scan. I don't care what you do. And that's what I mean that in between the two scanners, you got nothing under there. You just got so healed soft tissue. Keep in mind the words that I use, healed soft tissue. Now, what I did was I created what's called this power track screw. Because unlike an open tray or a closed tray impression coping that you can do whatever you want to it, that means cut it, modify it, uh, splint it. You can do anything you want to it. In the digital world, you cannot, cannot, change the geometry of the scan body because the second you change the geometry of the scan body when your designer goes to align your your scan scan body to the library scan body that overlap although may look perfect may be a little bit like this and not actually perfect and when you have four implants or six implants that five microns adds up to 25 or 30 or 50. And that's how you have broken restorations. So what I did was I said, well, I have a scan body and I know that I never want to touch that scan body, but I also know that I cannot um, mess up my, my soft tissue scan. Because another thing that unlike an analog, where the more data you have, the more accurate you think you are, master cast, working cast, solid cast, trial cast, Armin cast, Wally cast, art cast, every cast that you want to have, right? With every color dye to, to have anything that you want. In digital dentistry, the least amount of data that you have, the more likely you are to be accurate. So our scan, our rule is, if you have two scan bodies that are not be able to pick up in the same intraoral scan, you need something to connect them, okay? Now, in the, man, in the maxilla, because you have the rugae, which is a huge help, we don't use this, what I call the power track screw. We use composite or liquid dam or some sort of gingival barrier to create what we call a sigma curve. Remember, can't make a straight line. And you also can't make a ton of lines because although you want geometry, too much geometry is actually horrible for you because then the computer gets way too confused. You want simple geometry, simple distinct geometry. So in the maxilla, between my scan bodies, we create what's called the sigma curve. Basically, S's. S's between only the scan bodies that do not get picked up in, two, in one frame. And that's usually if you have an implant in one and an implant in four. It means you have more than a two-tooth span. It's usually like a three-tooth span. That's number one. Number two, in the mandible, where everything is moving, even if you do the sigma curve, it's possible that it's not going to be accurate because the tissue moves, right? So when you're attracting the patient, you can be pulling, your assistant may be pulling here and the sigma curve actually moves. So we need something static. So what I created was essentially something called the power track screw. That's that it's a screw that stands up from your scan body. Imagine this is your scan body. It stands up only about two millimeters because if it's too tall, you have the issue with scanning. It stands up. You take an ortho chain, cheap ortho chain. You can get a chain for $10 on Amazon, lasts forever. And you splint your scan bodies with your screws together, add composite so that your, comp your computer or your scanner can see something actual that's actually a solid and scan. In reality, that line after post-processing gets deleted. So it's never in your scan anyhow. It doesn't affect your occlusion, doesn't affect anything. If it doesn't get deleted, you can delete it yourself. But you know when you scan, what your scanner is doing is it's following this track. That's why we call it the power track. It's basically like train tracks that's following through. And that's how we get along edentulous, edentulous spaces, right? And, that, and that's really the easiest way to scan. And remember, we scan full arches in under one minute. If you scan a full arch with my system for longer than one minute, you're very likely to have an inaccurate scan because too much data is actually incorrect. Uh, you're, you're muted, Armin.
thanks for that. Got too many things to keep track of. I got one machine here. I got my iPhone to make sure everything's working. So thanks for uh, letting me know uh, that it's uh, it's muted. So this is a fun case right here that kind of uh, summarizes everything you just said. You have uh, mobile tissue in between the teeth. You have long edential spans here. The superstructures are prep teeth. They're going to be seen as abutments for a surgical guide. But the longer you go between these two objects, and like Jonathan was saying, uh, if you hit a patch of edentialism, you can't pick up superstructures or teeth in one single frame, you should assume that's inaccurate. So uh, let's go to Wally for this. Wally, how would you manage impressing a uh, clinical situation like this? I know it's not a surgical field, but certainly the, uh, the distance, the mobile tissue and the thin ridge can throw this scanner off. So I have two questions for you, Wally. Uh, especially since you're uh, from the from a uh, uh, teaching background and from a dental school background, uh, first question I always ask the students in the class is: When you take an impression, whether it's alginate or whether it's PVS, how do we know if it's accurate? I mean, to me, it's nuts that we would take a physical impression without knowing if it's accurate. We send it to the lab. We don't know if it was distorted. We don't know if it's uh, uh, set prematurely, and then we get a restoration or process back, and generally it fits, uh, and we're happy. But what could we do to make sure that our um, impressions are accurate before we even waste time fabricating stuff? That's uh, the first question for you, Wally, and Art and Johnny can jump in on that. And then particularly this case, what is your approach when you see this? Long edential span, mobile tissue, uh, thin ridge. Uh, I can tell you I scanned this a bunch of different ways, and the results were pretty spectacularly different. Like I, bought, I scanned this with trios. I scanned this with Medit. I tried. Uh, I took an algebra impression, I took a PVS impression, relined the temp, scanned the taglio that, merged all these models together to see, and every one of them was different. So how would you guys address that? This is a tough case. Um, this is a probably one of the more challenging cases to ever try to scan um, because you have the tongue that's hypertrophic that has expanded into the edential spaces. You have the floor of the mouth that is essentially non-keratinized tissue, on the long span edentulous ridges. And if you try to add um, some type of composite markers to the tissue, chances are your assistant will pull the cheek and it will move between scans. Um, this is very difficult. And you know, one way that you check accuracy is what you're doing here is precision is multiple scans overlaid upon another scan to see how close you are um, to the previous scan. You're gonna see huge discrepancies, I would assume. Yep. Um, this is a tough case. I would personally probably try to add some type of markers on the keratinized tissue, um, whether it's dots or something um, with blockout material um, along the super long span edentulous ridges right at the crest of the ridge. So it's on non-movable tissue. I would use a special retractor that moves the um, cheek and the tongue out of the way so it does not move between scans so that the scanner is able to track better. Um, yeah, this is, <laughs> that's impressive that you scan, do you scan that, Armin? Yeah, so that's this impressive. was scanned with a Trios 5. And what you're wow. looking at is exactly what you just said, two scans uh, with different scan paths. And I overlay them and look at the discrepancy between these two models. So the canines line up pretty nicely, but those molars, one model, both molars in the posterior were offset to the lingual. So that wow. means towards the back, it shrunk and it displaced it. And it's not lining up anywhere else. So as you traveled the, to the most distal position where those distal teeth are, so much error was introduced that uh, the model started going in different directions. So this is my first line of checking to see if something's accurate. This was grossly inaccurate. And the trick here is we don't know which one's the accurate one. So you gotta assume they're both inaccurate, right? Now, if they both lined up, uh, odds of these two lining up, um, uh, if they line up and it's pretty accurate, odds of them both being wrong and still lining up is one in a trillion. So it's fair to assume that those are accurate scans if they do match up, but these don't at all. And the point is here, it doesn't matter what scanner you're using. This is the, the newest scanner, the most technologically advanced scanner. Uh, it doesn't matter what you would have used in this situation. You still have to deal with this. And the main thing I wanted to, to make sure everyone's watching this uh, that we convey across to you is this, this green box that field of view. Jonathan did a great job of explaining it. Whenever I'm scanning this, if I can get two two structures or two implant superstructures in that green box, which by the way, the green box in the middle of the screen 
is a little bit longer than the actual live box. So I can't get clear answers from the manufacturer, which one is a true representation of what's happening clinically. But one good rule to follow is your superstructures, your preps should fit into this green box. And as soon as you have that, your confidence can skyrocket it's that is accurate. But if you don't, like in this uh, screenshot right here, you must make sure that you must assume that it's inaccurate. All right, is there anything you'd like to add to Wally's comments? No, I agree. I mean, if this is a crown and bridge case, this is this is very challenging without putting some type of geometry in that edentulous ridge so that there's a difference in that green frame when you're scanning from one frame to the next. Uh, because the scanner just sees pink tissue, it all looks the same. Um, so if we were going to be doing this with an intraoral scanner, we would have to introduce some type of geometry in between the preps um, to improve the accuracy. Now, if this is an implant case, it's pretty st straightforward, right? Because, you know, we have our scan bodies that are designed to link up to our registration material that links from one scan body to the next, and there's enough geometry from one frame to the next so that it links nicely. Uh, but an actual crown and bridge case like this is gonna be challenging without putting some type of geometry in between um, each edentulous space. Yeah, uh, years ago, we used to take an X tip and jab it on the ridge to give it some kind of tracking mechanism. Uh, Jonathan, is there anything you wanna to add to this equation? No, I think you guys said it pretty clearly. Right, I, so I, will say, I, I will say just one thing. If you, the participants that are there, if you guys have questions, um, please type it in the Q and A box. Yes, there, is there a, was there a is question. A Thanks for that, Jonathan. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, Adam Hogan is asking us what the scan path was. So, Adam, uh, what I did here is uh, I scanned once, going from here to here. This is to me, uh, Jonathan. You may disagree with this. To me, if you just scan from here to here, you've taken one impression. You have zero clue if it's accurate or not. So, I took one scan going from here to here. I took yet another scan going from here to here. Then I took a scan going from the middle and then expanding going over the midline over and again. I'll explain why I did that. Then I took an impression. Then I took the temporary the patient had and I relined those. And actually there's an alginate impression that's been uh, scanned. And so where you're looking at the purple dot, purple items are a scan of the intaglio, the temporary that was relined. And I actually got these to line up pretty nicely. So the fact that those not scanned intraorally, it was the scan of intaglio, and I've taken two separate impressions and I've merged them and they line up. And we just, two minutes ago, we both, we all agreed, if we take two separate distinct impressions and you merge them, you line them up. And if there's very little discrepancy between the two, it's fair to assume that um, it's accurate. So these two scans the, uh, resemble the, uh, each other the most closely. Every other intraoral scan that we took had a completely different result. Because once you hit that patch of edentulism, as we've been talking, once you hit that skinny ridge and you hit the mobile tissue, then you can start displacing where the model's being built. And next thing you know, you have errors. So uh, one thing to definitely emphasize to a lot of users, there's no shame in taking a physical impression and scanning it, so like taking the intaglio. I do that all the time. It just makes it super easy. And it's a great way to reassure yourself that uh, you're on the right track. So Jonathan, what would you do to to verify that your intraoral scan was accurate? So I um, mean, I don't really treat teeth, but uh, I'm assuming that this is uh, <laughs> uh, you're Imagine asking. It, if, I mean, if it was a suprastructure, same thing. Yeah, like what I would do is quite simple. I mean, on on this, if I had my scan bodies, I would use my power track screw, and, and there would be no problem. If you actually look closely, you know, somebody may be asking if they want to play devil's advocate and be like, dude. I don't understand. You took an impression of the of the uh, you took an impression, a physical impression of the of the patient, right? And then you took your scanner and you scanned that impression. Why is that working? But me scanning the mouth doesn't work. I, I don't understand. It's the same. It's the same edential bridge. You didn't do anything different. If you actually look really closely, like if you look closely between seventeen and twenty. 22, whatever, if you want to even call that teeth, teeth, I don't even know what those in people's mouths anymore. No, go back to that picture there. Uh, no, of the actual, uh, whether it's that or the scan or the thing, if you look, you actually have geometry. You actually have geometry between those, those teeth in your actual um, impression. If you actually, 
if the patient was like, say this was, think of it as like just acrylic. If you scanned that this was actually perfectly straight, you would not have the accuracy that you're having. The reason you're able to scan this and have it actually work is because it has one thing that's different in the mouth. It's non-mobile. In the mouth, you still have this, right? If you go back to the picture of your mouth, you have that line. But in the mouth, it's moving. And remember, you may not see it move, but look, in the mandible, it moves the most. And not only that, if you stop that frame for a second, look in the vestibule, look at the, look at the reflection in the, in the vestibule. In the lower, in the lower with, the, with all the saliva, that reflection also screws up. So I can tell you that in the mandible, if I scan a case, I always use powder. There, I, will never, I will never scan the mandible without powder because that is also another inaccuracy that shows up. And you'll know because you can even see, I don't know if it's your, your, um, your computer or your lag, but it's not moving as fast as it should be. When you create the, in, the internal to be as closest to that alginate impression as possible, no reflection, right? No mobility and actual structure, you're more likely to have a very uh, uh, a good impression. So it's not that you took an impression and it's better, it's just you took out the, the, the problem that you had. And it wasn't the scanner because you used the yeah. same scanner. Yeah. You had the same edentulous ridge. And that, that's why when people look at the research and say it's inaccurate, what's your studies? Like, shut up. Like, it's enough. Yeah. Like, understand why it doesn't work. And it didn't work because of two things. It was mobile, number one. It's a massive edentulous ridge, right? And there's reflection there. You can solve those problems very easily, but if you do the same thing over and over and over and expect to get a, a, this, a different result, like, what do you think? Like, you're not going to do the same thing over that fails and expect it to be different. And it's not the scanner, right? And, and a lot of the research will say to you, well, we use the same scanner. It always says, no, we use the same uh, experienced guy or girl to scan. Bro, exactly. I don't care how many teeth you took out. If you broke every single root tip, you don't know how to take teeth out. I don't care how experienced you are. So at the end of the day, you got to understand why it does not work. So when someone's going to say to you, well, you know what, John, this is too much for me. I'm just going to use a photogrammetry unit and I'm going to point at it. Newsflash, you still got to do what he did in photogrammetry. You still got to line up the bite. You still need the soft tissue scan. So congratulations, your restoration will always fit, but it may fit like this. That's, that's precisely why I show this, is to show you, you control those variables like you just cited perfectly. Uh, you have much better odds of, uh, of making this a success. So I thought it was a very clear example of how things can go awry. We scan a bunch of different ways. So breaking up that symmetric pattern is key, making sure you get as much within one frame as possible is key. All right, Wally, you want to contribute anything to that? Actually, you know what? Let me switch to Wally. Wally, since you're the printing expert, is there anything you can do real quickly with a printer that will help you uh, address the situation? Yeah, I mean, in really quick, you could print a try-in um, that will rest on the teeth and see if you have good fit. It, it would take probably about um, 10 minutes to, to print something like that to see how thing, the framework's fitting, if you had a quick design. And it doesn't even have to be a full contour design. It could just be something that rests over the teeth. Um, probably it's like what you, a custom tray, you're saying. It's like a custom tray. Um, you could, I think one of the things that I think is really cool here is I've seen people do with printing is um, prototype a temp and scan the temp just like you did, um, yeah. where you could reline a temp, whether it's printed or not. And then you could pick that up in your hand and scan it 360 degrees. And that could be a, a type of a final impression um, where you could invert that and design a new prosthesis on it. That's, that's, that's a very, start. very good point. Yeah, it's a, a, what we demonstrate. So the whole point of all this is for everyone to understand what the limitations are, and then you, everything falls into place. Jonathan's approach, Art's approach, your approach makes sense. Once you understand what the limiting factors are and what the challenges are and how you can overcome that. So Art, is there anything you want to add to that? I feel like a reporter on CNN or something. If, uh, <laughs> hey, you're, you're doing great. You're doing great, Armin. You look you sound like a pro, brother. So, you know, on, on that particular case in my practice, because I do treat teeth, I'm like Jonathan. Um, 
I, I, I would just take an impression of that. Um, and then I would, I would trim back the flanges on that impression and probably put it in the desktop scanner um, to, to get probably the most accurate, um, you know, relationship of what's actually in the mouth. But let me show you now, if that's an implant case, um, I'm glad that you guys talked about all the issues that we all experience specifically on the mandible. But I want to show you um, how we get around a lot of the things that Jonathan pointed out. And so what, what we have here is, you know, this is actually the day of surgery. It's the mandible. Um, and so what we did is we, we recognized that this is a very, very challenging scan to do on the day of surgery. So we created our scan bodies. And yes, they're tall. Uh, they're about 16 millimeters tall. Um, but, you know, if you look at the literature, you only need about seven millimeters of a scan body to align accurately. So the top portion of our scan body is, is just that, it's seven millimeters. And so the retentive feature down below here is what we use to get rid of the mobility issue that Jonathan expressed, because it's, 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 it's a big problem specifically in the mandible. And so we treat the mandible no different than we treat the, the, the uh, maxillary. We're going to create some stability um, from one scan body to the next. And so the stability comes from our scandar material. And so we, we squirt the scandar material in between each scan body. And um, now you have the rigidity on the mandible that's gonna help avoid um, mobility when you're scanning from, from the lip or from the tongue. And then also the one thing that Jonathan mentioned, which is so true is the reflective properties. So the scandar is, is developed to have the reflective properties that are conducive to, to scanning. And so you get rid of that, but it also has enough geometry from one scan body to the next. So even though you're not capturing, you know, each two scan bodies in one frame, you're capturing enough geometry in one frame to the next. So it doesn't matter how large that edentulous space is because you now have geometry in between it. So we're just capturing implant position here. Uh, we're not capturing soft tissue. A soft tissue record, which obviously is not as important as getting a passive fit from your implant position. So the other thing you'll notice is that our scan body are tapered. And so what we want to do is, you know, like Jonathan said, I mean, I, I mean, I've learned a lot from Jonathan and I really listened to what he said is like, you don't want to over scan. You don't want a gazillion frames, right? So how do we minimize the amount of frames that we get is we try to create a scan body in our case that's tapered. Um, and it doesn't have undercuts. And so when you pass over the occlusal, you're capturing 50, 60% of the scan body in one pass because it's tapered. And then you're gonna go back and capture the, the areas that you didn't catch on the first you know, scan, scanning from the occlusal. So that's how we get around it. And you know, we, we're scanning you know, very rapidly. Let me turn this down. So that noise is music to our ears, right? We know that it's tracking really, really nicely when you're going from one scan body to the next. And so as a result, you know, you're able to scan the mandible, the maxilla, without having to rely on the rugae or any other stable attached to their, uh, tissue. And so nonetheless, um, you know, that, that's, that's kind of essentially the way we get around it. And we just squirt this on. And this should take 60 seconds, you know, and we're not as fast as Jonathan. I don't think we scan, you know, at 60 seconds, but, um, you know, we're probably at 90 seconds. But anyways, that's just a quick overview of how we get around some of the, the issues that we all experience when it comes to, you know, scanning edentulous ridges. Art, I have a question for you, Art. Um, how are you guys scanning and pinning the um, soft tissue scan, which is not as important as you said, as the passive fit scan to this scan? Yeah. So you so got this scan, and now you got to do a soft tissue scan. How do you how do you get those guys merged? Yeah. So we we don't on the day of surgery we don't actively promote scanning the soft tissue for obvious reasons, right? You got stitches, you got, and so what we'll do is we'll just take a, a putty impression of the soft tissue, but the putty impression is of our healing, ab healing abutments that we've developed. And so now that healing abutment has a DME library that's related to the scan body. 
So oh. we're able to align the scan body to the healing abutment and we're taking a putty impression because you know what we what we teach is always protocols, right? <clears throat> if, we, if we if we say always scan, it doesn't always work. And, and the reason that we came up with this idea is because I was sick and tired when my clinical partners would come and ask me, hey doc, like, you know, do you want me to scan this one? Or do you want me to take an impression? Or, and then they go and try to scan it like, hey doc, it's not working. What do you want me to do? So let's just make it simple on the day of surgery. We're always gonna take a putty impression because it works all the time. And then you're gonna scan the putty impression versus scanning in the mouth and then aligning the two data sets. So okay. that's how you get around you know, scanning the soft tissue on the day of surgery and also scanning the implant position for a passive fit. Um, so I, I think a lot of people uh, that logged into here because they figure that, you know, I'm a pretty abrasive guy. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I do want to, I just want to interject here as an, although I, I love what you did, um, I, I would love to see, to see um, some refinement of this. I wanted, if you just give me the ability to share my screen, I wanted to show you something about what we, what we, um, what, what I've done in terms of what you said about, you know, uh, scanning the soft tissue the day of surgery. You know, one of my biggest problems with photogrammetry is that you need too many scans. There should be one scan. You, the only scan you should have to actually align is a temporary scan with teeth or like a mock-up scan and your implant scan. When you start to add too many scans into it and you have an outsourced designer member, there's a lot of things that can happen in translation. So I wanna show you something. So one of the biggest problems about, um, I don't, can you guys see this? One of the biggest problems about scanning on the day of surgery is blood. And uh, I would say maybe the, the lack of uh, understanding where your tissue is gonna be, right? So what happens is if you use a traditional scan body, right, a traditional scan body, what happens is, is that blood flies everywhere. And when blood flies everywhere, specifically if you have a meded scanner or a trio scanner, doesn't like red too much. When you scan these things, they just don't show up. So what I said to myself was like, you know what? I need to stop the bleeding. I need to be able to see my scan body all the time, right? And I need to be able to scan it really fast. So I looked and I looked and I looked, and this is another patent that I have. And I invented a scan body that is not only a scan body. It's a scan body. It's a healing abutment. It's a hemostatic uh, agent. And it's actually adjustable. It's the first scan body in the world that actually has different cuff heights. So in some cases where say you have two millimeters of tissue, if you look closely at the THS gap, you can see there's only uh, two dots. We've reinvented it now, it's got an actual number. So now your scan body will always be at the same height when you scan it. Your scanner will never have this or this right? It will always be exactly the same. Not only that, you have the ability to push down on the tissue. This is a very early picture. We aren't so good at suturing and stuff like that. But today, when we, when we put this in, this actually clamps down on your tissue, creates hemostasis right away. There is no blood. All right. And you now know exactly where the tissue is going to be. Because the reason tissue in surgery, the reason tissue changes because it moves. If you clamp it down, whether it's a bone suture, whether it's a THS gap, you have very much the ability to know where it's gonna be within one or two millimeters, okay? So now I'm able to take the picture of the implant. I now have my sutures as my geometry, okay? And I now have the ability to not have to worry about tissue covering my scan body because I chose a scan body that's exactly correct. Now, you don't have to do another scan of the tissue. I would love to be able to see your Skandar, right? After you actually suture everything closed because you're an amazing surgeon, amazing. And have a Skandar that is a different size. And then you can still use your, 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 blue, mo your blue mousse or whatever the, the bioregistration material, but you don't have to use so much of it. And you can still have the soft tissue there. 
right? In reality, actually, your blue mousse can actually be your soft tissue connection because you can take the whole thing out and you have a digital and an analog impression. So you would continue your scan and you can actually invert the bottom. And now you have everything connected in soft tissue. I hate that you have to take two scans. It's too hard. It's too much for people. So when you take one scan, you always see the scanner, right? One of the things that your scan body does that you always see the scan body. That's the, that's a genius about it. You always see that seven millimeters, no matter what, mm -hmm. but you're blocking everything that's under there. And you're doing a putty impression and you're doing all this stuff. You, it's, it's, un, it's not needed. If you have the ability to do what I did, which is create height adjustable scan bodies, right? And still create that, you know, that, that, that mesh that you want to create and you may want to create it this way. Let me show you Give me a second. Uh, let me just reshare the next one. Um, right, and this is how we, uh, can you guys see this, right? And this is how we connect everything together right? You don't have to worry about what the soft tissue like looks like under there. Why don't you create a power track under your Skandar? Create that so that you can actually have the soft tissue exposed. There's no reason for you to block all that. And you don't have to, you're too refined to have to put yourself into a second putty impression and this impression, right? You have the solution. Just add some, add some arms to your scan body. Well, that, that has another patent that somebody else that copied my shit did that, but <laughs> you don't have to do that. You can use a power track. You can use a, yeah. You already have the geometry there. You just got to cut under there. Can you, can you shoot back to your picture? Shoot back to your picture. You got to stop sh uh, sharing, John, so you can shoot back. Oh, oh, sorry. So, Jonathan. so Jonathan, on our, that, that photo you just showed, I mean, when we're doing for a heel site, um, there's no need for a putty impression. Right, because but, but you're still, but the point is, is mm -hmm. I, with this impression that I take, my next appointment is a screw tan prototype. That's my final. You're adding too many steps that are not necessary because you're not doing what you need to do the day of surgery. You should do it with the so, one scan. So what you, you're, when you make your final restoration, so I'm clear, Jonathan, when you make your final restoration, you're not re-scanning. Never. Too okay. much data. No, no, no. You, you, so you're just using the data from the original surgery. Yeah. So the implant positions haven't changed. Right. Right. No, but as far as the soft tissue goes. Soft tissue is quite simple because I suture everything that needs to be. So I over bulk the inside. I deliver the prototype, right? Yeah. I deliver a prototype two to four to six weeks, whatever, after that. And I check it. And if the prototype is missing a little bit in one, one spot, then I just add in the design. I don't need to rescan. You don't need to rescan if you suit. You're a great surgeon. Believe in what you do. Suture correctly, and shit doesn't move. Yeah. What we find though is there's there's always that patient right that's bleeding to death. And so one of the one of the reasons that but we put the uh, regardless of how great of a surgeon I am, there's still going to be some bleeding that goes on. And so right. as a result on those cases, right. And again, it's all about just trying to have like an always protocol. And I know that this is always going to work. And the soft tissue, because it's not so important, what's most important, what's most critical is getting a passive fit. That's what's most critical, right? We're going to, if we're a little off on the soft tissue, no big deal on the day of surgery. We're going to nail it on the day of, for the final restoration. And so it's too much, as, it's too much work. I'm sorry. I, can, I, I love you and I respect you, but it's too much work. Yeah, and I think it, but it's, I think the effort that you're putting into it is worth it. That's, I guess that's my point, right? And it takes, I mean, literally, bro, it takes like 90 seconds to take a putty impression and the patient's gone, we're done, right? Because our healing abutments are also there to stay, right? We're not, they're also, if we're delivering, let's say two hours later, or we're delivering the next day, we're not switching in and out different scan, different healing abutments because they're designed to kind of taper the tissue so it drops right in. So in order to get that nice passive fitting scan of the scan body, eradicating, eliminating the need to worry about blood, to worry about saliva, eliminating the need to worry about things that are mobile. And then why are you even taking a scan of the patient? What's that? If you're taking a putt, why are you even switching scan bodies? Why are you not taking an impression? You're taking an impression anyhow, just like Armin did. 
take an impression, just scan your impression. What are you bothering with your scan art and all that stuff? You don't need to do that. You already have a great impression. Well, I think taking an impression of the, you're saying taking an impression of our healing abundance, that's a, that's a workflow actually we teach also. Yeah, that's not a problem. You can do that. But then you have to make sure that somebody has a desktop scanner, right? No, because, or use an intro scanner. You scan well, your impression. You, yeah, you could. But in terms of getting a true passive fit, I think we all agree is if you have a desktop scanner with a field of view mm -hmm. that's much larger, it's going to be better than an intro scanner. Not, not necessarily. So, with intro scan of an impression, like you just described, and flipping the intaglio, very, very predictable. Because nothing's. I'm moving. just saying you're you, you're already taking the impression, so your yeah. original scan is useless. Is what I'm saying. You 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 have too much redundancy. Well, I think the the other challenge too that we find is you know if you're let's say you're um, you're trying to scan a pterygoid, right, and the angle of it is a little obtuse, and you're trying to take an impression of it. Sometimes there's some distortion in that if your implants are not all parallel. So I hear you loud and clear, Jonathan. I think I think you know your points are valid, but I guess what I'm saying is the the amount of ex, extra effort and time that we put into it, it's not a big deal, um, you know, for us. Uh, before I forget, uh, for one, uh, thanks for that that dialogue. I think for everybody that's listening in, we have a lot of attendees. It's great for them to hear you guys discuss this at a high level. So that so again, there's a lot to be learned there from uh, from both of you. So that's that's great. One thing, John, that you mentioned, I did not know, and we've had a few of your users tell us, so they've been struggling with this. So generally what happens is you have a flat ridge like this, you have a scan body on top, and when you're scanning from the occlusal surface, especially a tall scan body, if you just pick up the occlusal information, you don't pick up the stem or the stock of the scan body, and then you have the tissue, when you stop scanning, even the Shios 5 does that now, even if you have the AI off, if the body isn't connected to the tissue, it deletes that. So what yep. people start doing is start angling it to fill in that body. And next thing you know, now you've got the dark aura pharynx. You just introduce so many layers of complication. So the biggest thing I picked up this weekend, I'm glad you brought that up, is that you can change the tissue heights in your scan body and compress the tissue. That scan body touching the tissue is going to be a massive advantage. So I think it's a stellar uh, property of your, of your scan body. You can do that. So we had a few of you users uh, contact us so that it constantly gets deleted. And uh, is there a limit to that height, John? Is there, or do they not know that it's adjustable height? So what's the what, issue there? What, happen, uh, what happens is, is that users, I always tell users is that if you, the, how do you choose the height? It comes in one, two, three, and four millimeters. It's, it kind of covers 100% of every single indication. If you look under your skirt or what we call the skirt of the scan body and there's a gap, your scan body is too, is too small. It is so is it big. adjustable or you have to switch, swap it out? No, you got to swap it out. Okay. When you, earlier you said adjustable. I thought you meant meaning, it's, uh, meaning it, you can choose whichever one okay. you want. It doesn't right. have a crank in it. So it's variable, not adjustable. Right. Yeah, yeah variable, adjustable though. means it's the same unit needs to be. So all no, of no, your no. users have different high collars that they can. Uh, That's correct. So that compression then, of the tissue is absolutely paramount and imperative to, uh, to do. Yeah. Uh, just so you guys know, we're uh, a little past the six o'clock time. Uh, maybe we. Just, uh, uh, plan a lot more time next time. If there's a follow-up, there's some questions. I want to save some time for that. We got uh, Satar Syed asking, uh, what scanners do you recommend? He, has, uh, he or she has a emerald, uh, uh, an emerald scanner. It's very simple. I think we covered it today. Uh, any scanner can work. Any scanner can introduce errors. Uh, you, the user, are completely in control of that. But if you want to buy a scanner, we recommend the Trios 5. You can pick it up from Cadre. Uh, let's see who else has uh, any questions here. Um, uh, Adam Hogan says he loves his uh, photogrammetry. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, and service system is good for all. Chris Hatsis, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, how do you know if you have a true passive fit art? Uh, and Wally, you guys will get a chance to answer this. Is it a field? Art mentioned a few microns can result in restorations breaking. So, a great question. Are you taking x rays? How are you judging the passivity of your fit? Yeah, for us, we take x-rays upon seating. Um, and also just, I, I think one of, the, one of the biggest differences that I found once I started going digital was the way the screw literally fills. I mean, I used to do stone verification jig, stone verification jig, stone verification jig, because they kept breaking and breaking and breaking. <laughs> and you start realizing like, oh my gosh, you know, there's a lot of human error um, built into these, these verification jigs that people are building. 
you know, and then come to find out like the guy that just got hired, you know, two weeks ago is making the stone verification jig. So, um, so what I noticed right away was when you seek these restorations, you know, literally the screw just goes in like butter. Like you don't even have any whatsoever tension there. And that was, for me, that was a big difference from going from verification jigs to going digital. The second thing is, you know, taking x-rays. Yes, I understand that it's two dimensional, but it's pretty clear, you know, that it's seating all the way in addition to just getting that passive fit. I can tell immediately when I seat it, I mean, that thing is rock solid, right? In the past, when I was doing verification, it was always a little wobbly, right? It just moves a little bit. So those are just some ways that my comparison of going analog to digital was very, very clear that it was distinctly different. Paul, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, there's the single screw passivity test, like the Sheffield's test, where you where you um, basically will screw um, one screw in at a time, and and you're looking for whether or not you have um, the same fit as when you're doing multiple screws, and you have also the ability to hear and feel um, almost like a screeching sound as you're you're tightening that screw and it starts to, you just kind of, kind of feel it. I go, I don't do the Sheffield's test. I more, when I put those screws in and I start to hear like crunching or creaky sounds, I know it's not right. Um, and you start to torque down on those screws and you, you, you could get it to kind of appear seated on a radiograph, but those are screws are under tension. You'll get breakage eventually. Um, I, I hate that. It's kind of a thing where you, it, it's an experience thing, but I've had uh, it's, I wish there was an easy test. Jonathan, you probably have a better way to tell than I do um, from all your experience of, of these. But for me, it's just that that crunching, creaky sound when I'm screwing those things in. You know, I can tell you that um, since I started using the Powerball screw, um, which is my other invention, I um, you can tell on contact if your restoration fits or doesn't. Because what people don't actually know is that in your tie base, your tie base actually does not engage your multi-unit as you think it does. There's actually a massive, massive, massive gap. So what happens is, is that you won't get it right away and you won't know right away. You'll actually get the restoration to seat, quote unquote, with the tie base. What will happen is in that three months or at, at six months um, is that the tie base will actually debond. Yep. And it will debond over and over and over and over and over. The way that we used to get around that is that if we had a restoration that didn't fit and this would happen, we used to put the tie base in the patient's mouth. We used to ream out the inside of the zirconia restoration and we used to pick it up and then it was passive, <laughs> right? So that was one way we got around it without having to remake the restoration. But with the Powerball screw, there's no faking it. Um, you, know when it you know when it's not passive? when he gets to the front door and he hears a massive crack because it happens right away and you hear boom and you and as you actually screw it in you'll you'll feel it and you'll hear it you hear that <laughs> i will tell you that with my powerball 2.0 you at zero to 20 noon centimeters you do not hear the noise but from 20 to 25 which is the secondary retentive feature of uh preventing you from screw loosening you hear the screw engaging into the restoration remember it's not the screw not fitting into the multi-unit it's already in the multi-unit it's engaging into the restoration from 20 to 25 so that you get that extra that extra here so you do hear the now if the second you go from zero to five you hear, you know it's not fitting because the screw is not in its in the exact channel that it's supposed to be so you actually feel it and you hear it there's no you know when when i first started this is what i used to do when i used to put it in i'm like all right let me cover my ears and let me go like this i didn't hear anything fits get out of here right? <laughs> but then it always come back to bite you when things break right um so so that was definitely uh one of the things uh, the other things that people have to understand we focus so much on on the first part you know in my course we talk about that i don't know if art you remember this very famous uh um slide that i had it's called um design uh it's called acquisition design and manufacturing and we break it down into three different things that could go wrong and today we really spent the past 90 minutes really talking about ac acquisition Dude, design and gone to manufacturing and all the errors we could introduce there. Yeah, that's great. Well, not only introducing, but 
uh, errors that you don't even know. Like, you know, like I'm sure you've seen, you've been following me on, on Facebook for the past month. In the past month, I've had more fractures in my restorations um, than I've had in the past six years that I've been doing this digital full arch thing. And I did had no idea. And I just did. And I did what I teach my students to do, like, look at that paper and figure out what's wrong. And I'm like, Churros 5, it's been the same. Nothing has changed. Exactly the same. Scan bodies the same. Scan paths are the same. Everything the same. Design. Design is the same. Alignment of scan bodies were the same. And then the last thing was the manufacturing. Now, the manufacturing, there's, a, there's another variable that you don't even know, that you don't even think about. And that's a zirconia. When it says 1.236 in shrinking factor, do you know that that lot is not defective? You have no clue. You could have done everything, Insta Risa photogrammetry, everything you want, man. And you did the prototype and the prototype fit and the verification did fit, everything fit. And then you go and you do a titanium bar or you do a full zirconia restoration and it done fit and it breaks. And it breaks over and over and over and you mill it 20 times and done fit. And you're like, oh my God. And you have so many milling machines, you have no idea which one is wrong. <laughs> so you gotta go back to the beginning. And is it the oven? Is it the zirconia? Is it the tools? Is it the machine? And at the end of the day, we were able to finally um, narrow it down. It was one machine. One machine had a bug in it. And since we stopped using that machine, Everything's back to normal. Everything fits and fits and fits and fits and fits. Was it a wobble? Worse, <laughs> worse than wobble. Because at least the wobble, you can hear it and you could see it. Yeah. This is a shift. This is even worse. Yeah. You don't even see the shift. Yeah, I saw the restorations, like half the wall is wider than uh, the rest you would of the body. Well, that's when you only test one. Yeah. But imagine everything is shifted like this. Everything yeah. is milled perfectly. You look at it, but everything is shifted like that. So when you look down, yeah. instead of looking down the access hole and seeing the top of the multi-unit, the top the multi-unit is actually like here. Yeah. And that's like an what we call an A B shift. But I, I didn't understand that because I never had that problem before. Like we would have never thought it passes calibration. The tools are new. The oven is checked. The zirconia factor is checked. The template and cam hasn't been hasn't changed. And what happens is, is that you go to zirconia. Zirconia will tell you, no, everything's good. You go to the machine. Everybody, everything's good. Cam's good. Everybody's telling everybody's good. But you, you remember when you take this on, you're the quarterback. It's all on you to find out where in your system something broke. Someone is not. Someone's not behaving. And I, thank God it only took me a month to figure it out. But you know, like I would say, like, you know, Wally tells me, like, dude, you're always doing full arch cases. Well, I can tell you, like, in the past week, it's actually, I've actually been breathing because every time I was putting them in for the past 30 days, I'm like, dude, the upper fits, but the bottom doesn't, or the bottom fits and the upper doesn't. Well, what the hell is going on? And it's quite, quite embarrassing when you do that to the patient and, and, and you're like, it's yeah, not like the, it's, you can't the section it. You're providing is high end stuff and you cannot, yeah, uh, yeah you got to deliver on the promise. All right, I think we should wind this down. There's a ton of questions. Uh, for one, all the participants, attendees, so we appreciate you guys being on. That's our motivation. So if you want to see more of this, uh, let us know, and uh, we can uh, do this uh, uh, frequently. Uh, Wally, how can people find you? Again, I'm embarrassed to ask that question. People know how to find you, but in case there's a handful of people who don't know how to contact you, what's the best way for them to reach you in your courses? Yeah, check us out at themodestitute.com and um, on the Facebook group, 3D Printing and Dentistry. Fantastic. All right. What's a good way to find you? Yeah, real simple. Instaresa.com. You can email us at info at Instaresa.com. Jonathan, how do we send out a bad signal for you? <laughs> um, you could look up my parts. There's some free webinars on thepowerballscrew.com. If you want to learn about our online screw uh, online uh, courses, smilesyllabus.com. Uh, we answer this once a week for you, Jonathan, from our users. Where do they find your uh, scam bodies and your uh, Powerball screws? How do they order them? Thepowerballscrew.com. The Powerball screw, not just Powerball screw. All right, fantastic. If you want to find me, I'm on uh, at cadre.com, C-A-D-R-A-Y.com, cadre.com. And thanks a lot. So we'd love your feedback. This grows, we can probably get to the point where we're adding uh, C units and making it a formal thing. We'll see how it goes. So we had a lot of fun. Appreciate everybody for joining. Uh, great job, guys. Appreciate your time.
Thank you Thanks so everybody. much. Thank you, everybody. Bless you. Thank you. Bye. Take care.